Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to this roundtable on the topic of building legacy, securing lasting impact of sporting mega events. I'm Ed Stapley, editor at Bloomberg Live, and I must say what an incredible time to be having this conversation. We have the Euros uh, underway already, the Olympics set to take place in Japan this year, we hope, and the Football World Cup in Qatar taking place in 2022, amongst other significant events. Sport permeates all of our everyday lives. It provides us with an outlet, a purpose, a sense of pride. It's about hopes and dreams, the triumph of the underdog, the smashing of world records, and the pushing of all boundaries, especially when it comes to mental and physical endurance. But aside from the sort of sporting spectacle, mega events have the ability to change the face of their host cities and the communities as well. You know, the legacy of tournaments can have a, a range of outcomes. They can be planned and unplanned, positive and negative, tangible and intangible, global, local, and individual. So we have 45 minutes, and I'd, I'd like to keep this discussion conversational, open and frank, and I encourage you to all please jump in when you have something to add, or you can also virtually raise your hand on screen, and I'll do my best to come to you. We've got a great range of perspectives on this roundtable. If you'd like to know more about any participants, then you can visit their speaker bios on the forum portal. I want to start by asking you all to introduce yourself briefly, and to say a bit about how you approach the concept of legacy and sporting events. It'd be great if you can share some examples and experiences of how you've worked on crafting legacy in your respective roles. So with that, uh, Robbie McRobbie, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Um, you know, the, the, HR, uh, the HKIU organizes the famous Hong Kong Rugby Sevens alongside some domestic leagues as well. Um, I've never been to the Hong Kong Sevens, but its reputation really does sort of precede it. Why do you think that is and how have you built up that brand? Well, well first of all, uh, Ed, you, you'd be very welcome. We, we look forward to, uh, <laughs> Thank you. to bringing you to Hong Kong. Um, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic weekend. It's, it's the Mardi Gras of, of Hong Kong. Um, it, it's a really international uh, event. People from all over the world come, come to Hong Kong and they keep on coming back year after year. So, you, you know, we're, we're incredibly fortunate. Um, three blokes in the pub had the idea uh, in 1976. Some of the best ideas in the world have come from, from, from people being in a pub together. Uh, and we've inherited the legacy of it and, and we've been able to build, build on that. And we, you know, it's grown out into a week, week now of events. Um, and, yeah, for, for for us, the the impact on on the Hong Kong community, you know, in the economy and everything else is is huge, and the legacy that's left behind. We don't use agencies; we are a national sports association. All the money that that we we generate from the sevens goes back into the community. We invest it in in sports pitches, uh, community facilities, and programs. So, yeah, for for us, it's it's a massively important uh, event. Um, uh, and this last year. Uh, unfortunately, you know, we haven't got the greatest commercial model. 95% of our revenue comes from that one event. So, um, yeah, I, I've I've recorded record losses, Ed, um, in the yeah. last two years. So I've <laughs> certainly written my page in the uh, HKRU history book. Yeah, um, that's a huge amount, 95% revenue. Um, how, how have you sort of, I guess, how have you dealt with that? Have you had to pivot? Have you had to just wait it out? Yeah, it's a great word, isn't it? Pivot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've, I've, you've, you've never seen a man pivot as much as I've been pivoting. Yeah, it. Um, yeah it's, it's been it's been tough. We we've had redundancies, we've had pay cuts, um, yeah. we've 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 had to shut down uh, yeah. the professional men's fifteens program. Um, so yeah, there's been a lot of pain, but you know our community is resilient. Hong Kong is resilient, um, and you know we're we're looking ahead now. We're, we're due to have a sevens in November this year, so. Fingers crossed, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come through it and we'll be a leaner and meaner um, sporting organisation on the back of it. But hopefully, you know, better set for, for long-term um, sustainability. Mm, indeed. And Hua Feng Te, you have significant viewership and engagement for your mixed martial arts platform. How do you think about building legacy with your specific community? Yeah, I think, you know, for us, um, legacy starts in the fact that of all the global sports pro properties, we're the youngest. You know, we were founded in 2011 uh, and in a short span of 10 years, you know, out of Asia, we have uh, now broadcast to over 150 uh, countries. Uh, and as you mentioned, huge, uh, you know, viewership and traction on the online world, obviously helped by the fact that we were born into the digital age. And then partners like, you know, Joey at Facebook work very closely with us in celebrating and expanding, you know, our community. Um, so really, you know, we're the, we're the first and only global sports media property out of Asia. Uh, there are many sports leagues uh, in Asia, but many of them tend to be 
um, broadcast or distributed in one at most two or three countries. You know, we're the only one that is done globally. And, you know, I think on that basis alone, it makes me as someone from Asia to feel proud to be putting Asia on the world sports map, uh, especially given that when I was growing up, most of the global sports IPs that I followed, NBA, you know, NFL, et cetera, were all exported into Asia. So for now, for me to be part of something that is building something out of Asia for export to the world is great. Um, you know, we talked a bit about uh, COVID just now. I think um, the other fortunate thing about our situation is that, you know, we are ultimately a media business. And, you know, um, and look, once again, I, I wouldn't um, wish COVID upon the world. And we had to take a short hiatus last year uh, for live events, which ultimately is the crown jewel right, of any sports IP. Um, but at the same time, uh, during the height of COVID, people are at home looking at a screen. So be it us, you know, the NBA, uh, the UFC, other sports IPs, that's an opportunity, right, to, to serve people uh, who are stuck at home and need some cheer. <laughs> people ultimately, yeah. rain or shine, want to be entertained. So we actually exited last year with record high, you know, viewership numbers, uh, both on TV uh, and on digital mediums. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And I guess, you know, this is very much a global panel, but while we're on Asia, uh, Tekin, I want to come to you. Um, sports Singapore's sort of core purpose is about empowering people to live better through sport, helping bring sport into the lives of or basically all Singaporeans, I guess, is, is, is your focus. How do you encourage that sort of participation and keep up, I guess, consistency of participation as well is, is key? Well, thank you, Ed, for the question. I think when we when we look at legacy from sporting events, uh, we obviously have to think about uh, development over a multi-year period. Mm -hmm. And as we begin to work with our event partners who we invest in through our government grants, uh, we think about how to set up those uh, those impacts, right? So, for example, if we know that we're going to run a, a major event, whether it's going to be the rugby sevens or whether it's a one, uh, you know, it's a swimming championships that we're running year after year, we have to make sure that the receptacles uh, that follow the interest in that sport when that event is run are ready and able to take on that interest. If not, all that just goes down the tubes. Likewise, when we look at the economic impact uh, that a sporting event series may have on Singapore, we want to be able to look at the industry ecosystem that we're building in Singapore to ensure that the follow on capabilities and the, the opportunities for industry are there for the taking. So we ran the WTA finals uh, for quite a period of time in Singapore. And subsequently, I think certain industry capabilities were built up such that uh, when we did the ATP 250 at the start of this year, we were able to put that up in short time with local industry capability that was already experienced in running a strong event. So a level of pre-planning before uh, to set up the system, a level of you know ongoing lessons that are learned and then evolving industry structures, and then to create community receptacles uh, to be able to take on the follow-on interest from an event. Mm -hmm. Yeah, brilliant. Um Yes, and moving from, from Singapore, if we have our world map down to Australia. Um, Craig, um, the Australian Open went ahead in February. You, you were delayed by a few weeks due to COVID. How hard was it to organise that tournament under the circumstances? Um, you know, how, How's the sort of legacy of the tournament evolved with, with time? Well, you know, I think, uh, thanks, Ed, for the question. I, I've only just got out of bed. That's three months later. I mean, it's, it's a... <laughs> I think everyone that's run running entertainment and sporting events uh, will know the difficulty of running it during this period of time since March last year. And we came out of the bushfires uh, of our event in January last year into uh, into COVID. And so we had our crisis team already ready to go. We didn't know we'd be going into a pandemic a, a month after we we had to deal with that crisis. But but the I think the the most important learnings that we had we fortunate. In the, that we have an event that's over 130 years old that's built its legacy uh, as providing you know a, a significant economic impact to the city of Melbourne, the, the country, the state of Victoria, country of Australia, and and so therefore there was no other option but to find a way to make the event work in the middle of the of the pandemic. And I think what's really important on the to to the legacy piece is is momentum and innovation. And uh, and I think the the the, the being you know, I think the largest uh, global annual global sporting event in the Southern Hemisphere. It ultimately was on us uh, to make sure we can continue with that uh, momentum and with that innovation. And the innovation was presented to us differently this year, and it would be to everyone else on this call and, and in listening when you're delivering events, because it's innovation around managing a health crisis. 
Um, I think eventually that's going to shift from a health crisis to more of a financial one. And then how can we manage the tension between when our partners and sponsors are wanting more for less and when our content, our players are wanting also more for less. And that tension, that that gap is going to widen and it's how we manage uh, in that gap that's going to be really important just for events. So we were proud of the delivery, um, but having 600 people, you know, toward 12,000 people and 600 full-time work in the period of not just the three weeks of the event, um, but bringing in uh, over 1,000 people into a pandemic, a COVID-free environment, having them in 14 days of quarantine on 17 charter flights of a period of 48 hours, and ensuring we were not the result of a third wave in the country was a pretty stressful thing. Um, but uh, I got to see some great global commentary on what we should and we shouldn't do, but let's also learn how yeah. to just go ahead and just do what you think's best, and if it works out, great. Yeah, everyone has an opinion, right? And I'd love to get to uh, some more of yours on, on COVID more broadly. Um, but I think jumping from tennis to football, um, Nasser Al Qatar, I think, has joined us now. Um, he is the CEO of FIFA World Cup Qatar 2022. Um, Nasser, can, can, are you there? Can you hear me okay? Yes, Ed, I can hear you Fantastic. and everybody else that's on this uh, forum. Brilliant. Well, thanks so much for joining. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, how have you approached this idea of building an enduring legacy for the Football World Cup next year? Ed, before I jump into the planning of legacy and how it was implemented and how we can see the benefits of legacy, I just want to uh, discuss legacy um, in light of COVID. I want to just uh, also mm -hmm. uh, follow up on what Craig was saying is, Obviously, the pandemic took us all by surprise and has become probably the defining um, element of the century, probably. And we've all had to adapt to it personally, professionally. And in light of sporting events, unfortunately, we've seen the effect that it's had on a lot of sporting events. Um, most prominently now is the Tokyo Olympics. So the legacy that we've put forward is in anticipation for the World Cup and the possibility of this pandemic uh, going forward and the possibility of it lasting, which we all hope that the scientific and medical community is going to be able to get over this as quickly as possible. We have imp implemented a lot of measures. As you know, we've hosted all, over 100 games since September and all with the returning fans into the stadium. So um, we've, hold, we've held the AFC Champions League uh, qualifiers for the East and West in a centralized manner. It's never been held in a centralized manner. We've implemented strict protocols um, and compliance uh, measures. We've uh, tested all uh, members of the local organizing com committee. We've tested all players regularly. Um, we've implemented a bio uh, bubble concept. And even the fans, the 30% fans which returned to the stadiums were tested um, prior to the match using the uh, uh, antigen, lateral antigen tests. Um, we've tracked it since then. We've had no cases as a result of, of these uh, tournaments. And we've actually created the playbook that goes into the, the details of how to manage large sporting events. And this playbook is ready for anybody that wants to uh, benefit from the experiences that we've had. Um, the FIFA World Cup was the first actual FIFA event that took place. It was supposed to take place in December. Finally, it took place in uh, February of 2021. And again, it was implementing the same measures. FIFA have taken our playbook compared it to their uh, measures and have taken a lot of lessons from there. Now, speaking more broadly on the question of legacy, um, in 2010, when we won the rights to host the World Cup, we've looked at previous um, uh, mega events. And without going into details of the countries that we've looked at, a lot of them struggled with use of the stadiums after the World Cup. Uh, many of them were new builds, many of them were refurbishments. They had no legacy plans after that. And what we decided to do is in the design of all the stadiums, we've looked at the use of the stadiums post the World Cup. So right now we have a stadium, Ras uh, al Stadium, which will be completely dismantled after the World Cup. This is a, a fully steel structure stadium that uses containers, and that will be fully dismantled because it's, it's, it's a stadium that we don't really need. All of our stadiums will be reduced in capacity. If there are 40,000, which is the minimum that FIFA requirements will go down to 20,000, and some stadiums will be completely converted to uh, um, use of, of a non-sporting nature after the World Cup. 
That's really interesting. Um, and I think there'll, there'll be um, comments as well on, on how you manage infrastructure, um, you know, more broadly after a mega event like that, because obviously you're not necessarily yearly going to get those huge. We can huge do as a World Cup to be able to. There, I don't know if you can still hear me. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you dropped out there. Do, do continue on, on any point you're about to make. I've lost sound. Okay, okay. We'll we'll move on and, and we'll come back to uh, to NASA. Um, Maggie, I don't know uh, if you can hear me, but I've lost sound. Um, there was a glitch. NASA, can you hear me? No, okay. I can't hear anything. We'll uh, we'll get a tech on that. Um, hopefully. In the meantime, <laughs> Maggie Cruz Blanco, I'd like to come to you. Um, and um, if we could maybe mute NASA while he's fixing his tech problem, that'd be great. Um, Adeco Group has a number of different industry brands which share the collective goal to sort of shape the future of work. And this really plays into sports in such a big way because really people are the, uh, you know, the essence of what makes a tournament. When it comes to sport, how, how do you go about placing individuals such as athletes, officials, uh, and industry professionals in roles where they can build their own legacies? All right. Thank you so much Ed, for having me. And maybe maybe before going to, into that um, question, I'd like just to um, say a little bit more about the, the philosophy of uh, mega sporting events. I of heard course, all yeah. folks talking around, you know, infrastructure, how you stage the events. I'd like maybe to, to give a perspective Please. from another. And I think um, when it comes to mega sporting events, it's, it's really addressing some of the core elements of the mandate of sports organizations. So one is developing the sports and the other one is, of, co of course, organizing competitions. So from my experience, uh, the legacy programs and the impact of mega sporting events have to start really before, even during the bidding process. And I like to look more from the from the other angles, so not just the infrastructure and how to stage the event, but actually there are other elements which I feel are fundamental, which is the development of the sports and how a mega sporting event could actually impact on the development of the sports, the athlete well-being and the pathway you create for athletes, not only in the place where the sporting event is taking actually more broadly in the region and what changes could we make from the development perspective. I think the other important element is a fantastic opportunity to create a program around diversity and inclusion and community and sports for good. So that for me should be from the very beginning uh, uh, when you are bidding actually for a mega sporting event, but also through that process. And what your experience is that the focus is typically on the event and delivering, but this is one part that is fundamental. And then just to address what you were saying around, you know, the people and, mm -hmm. and the role of, you know, companies like the Adeco Group or our vision within LHA Sports Solutions mm -hmm. is how you create opportunities for workforce renewal, how you look at, you know, the future of the athletes in the context of mega sporting events and what kind of transition journeys you can create for those athletes that are probably retiring after a mega sporting events, but also around the people that work in the events themselves. And this is a, also a journey that doesn't start, you know, the day after the event is closing, but as part of the legacy, how may we create the process and the journey that everyone that works in the event could actually see the future beyond that moment when the final whistle blows. And so creating a legacy for workforce renewal bringing those people that have learned so much on a staging an event within the sports industry in the host country or in, in globally, I think is one of the core legacies that we have to think, no matter the sports, no matter the event. Because often what happens is that we lose that talent, that we lose that knowledge. And I think that's one of the, for us, one of the core vision of, of what we want to create with sports solutions is really bringing that kind of legacies for athletes, for professionals, for the people that are hosting and organizing the events. And imagine how great it would be if the sports industry kind of refit itself with those people hosting and, and organizing the events and really living that experience. So mm. that's from my side. I, I think the whole career transition with athletes is fascinating because we're all following these 20, 30 year olds, aren't we? And it gets to a point where they retire in their late 30s, a lot of them, if not before. 
<clears throat> and you know what do they do how, how do you you know I, i'm fascinated by this because if you look at the the sort of pundits on a lot of these these programs in the uk we have gary lineker basically dominating um a lot of it but you know he's in his sort of 60s now and um there's quite a funny interview with a football player um who basically said who's gary lineker and it, it was a fair point because he wasn't even born when gary lineker was playing football and yet, where are the new pundits, the retiring footballers? And I'm not saying pundits is just the only thing you can do. It's probably the most glamorous thing you can do as a, as a, as a sportsman when you, when you finish. But how do you give advice to people um, who, who ha whose careers are so short? And, and you know, what, what can they do? Then maybe they're not particularly media savvy, but what, yeah. what, what, what does one do in that situation? Because I think most sports, is, they're not hugely, you know, and, and OK, the superstars make a lot of money, but what, what, what do the others do? It's the great majority, actually, that don't make a lot of money. And I, I think it's not to wait to that point of retirement. It's really creating a journey for the athletes that think before retirement, what do I want to do? What is my career outlook? But also it's a lot of education around what are the core attributes I learned as an athlete in sports that are transferable into a broader labor market and often this is this this question only happens when the athletes in, in the moment of changing identity from being an athlete to then jumping into another role and that is one of the most challenging moments so if a sports organizations athletes and you know the whole ecosystem thinks before retirement what is the pathway how can we help athletes from youth level towards that retirement moment because what you find is that most athletes see it as a, as a panic moment. It's a terrifying moment. If you think, for example, Abby Wambach, one of the most successful footballers um, in the world, the moment she retired, she said, professionals call it transitioning. I call it terrifying. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's pursuing what kind of career do I pursue? What do I bring that, that I can compete with other people that are already in the labor market for mm -hmm. five, 10 years that have that experience? And then the education is on the employer side too. So it's how companies understand what athletes bring from, bring from sports that actually could balance perhaps a lack of experience and what kind of employee life cycle you create for an athlete to be welcome in a company, but also to be able to learn and quickly uh, you know, get what it needs to be successful in a role and also to retain that talent. Because often what happened is that companies said, we'd love to have an athlete. They are amazing ambassadors, communicators, but then the right role is not there for them to stay. So it's how you retain that talent. Too. Right, absolutely. So let's pivot from um, that idea as quite a nice sort of move from uh, sport into business. And I want to come to sort of a business point of view. Uh, Joy, you, you head up um, sports partnerships um, for Asia Pacific at Facebook. Um, you know, social media plays a crucial role in amplifying big sporting moments and trending topics. I see sport highlights on my news feeds all the time. How does Facebook and Instagram approach the world of sport and how does the company think about amplifying the right kind of legacies? Yeah, so um, let me start with legacy. Uh, legacy for us is partners using our platforms and creating legacy of their own. So today, if it's one championship or tennis Australia or anyone else, you know, if they are able to uh, create value out of using our apps, I think I think that's that's great endorsement. Uh, so uh, you know, Facebook is about you know giving people the power to build community and bring the world closer together, and sports plays a big role in this. Sports is social; it brings in people; it provides connection. And what our team does is we work with media, federations, leagues, athletes, and we help them uh, build a, an audience-based fandom on our, on our family of apps. And then we help them uh, monetize them. And I think uh, you touched on a couple of great topics. You know, what happens to the athletes when they retire, right? So we work with athletes. We work with athletes and help them create a brand which can outlast their, and again, it's not for everyone, you know, they're like, tens of thousands, millions of athletes. But even if you not, even if you look at the mid-tier athletes, we help them create a brand which can outlast their competitive career. And we have, at the same time, we have tools to protect them from online harassment. So what we do is we power our partners with, with a fan base. We power our partners with an audience base. We share best practices. We 
We help them to build a business on our platforms. And one of my favorite examples, you know, there have been like great examples of what NBA or Tennis Australia, one championship does. But a great example for me is there's a small judo club, jiu-jitsu club in Melbourne. And it just has a couple of thousand followers on Facebook. And each time they do an event and each time they post it on Facebook through various monetization tools, they are able to uh, generate revenue in tens of thousands of dollars. Now, tens of thousands of dollars might not be big for Craig or maybe big for Hua Feng. Uh, but the reality is for a small club, which is in Melbourne, it, it, it is what is one of the, uh, it probably sustains them. It helps them sustain and grow. And that's what we try to do. We try to power the big brands, the big organizations. We also work with the, the torso and the tail. And sometimes some of the most inspiring stories come from the smaller partners and not the bigger partners. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, Abdul Rahman, jump in here. Um, how's big data, you know, from, from the Google Cloud point of view, um, how has big data and AI-driven analytics evolved the way we interact and think about these tournaments, do you think? And what's the future of fan engagement with that in mind? Um, you know, data is just everywhere and it's changing sort of the way it drives events in many ways and interaction with events in many ways. From the Google slash Google Cloud point of view, you know, what's the legacy in, of using technology and how do you think about it? Yeah, good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, data, it's all about data. Actually, we are living in the world of data. And if there are, the analysis indicated that the, da the currently 90% uh, of the data uh, globally has been gathered and collected in the last two years. And that gives you an indication of how much data is, is very important. Taken that into our uh, the legacy of the of the of the region itself, the region has always been known to be the largest oil producing uh, region. Uh, from what has been going through in the major transformation for many of the countries in the region and uh, towards digital transformation, uh, data has become more or less the new oil for the region. And and the uh, uh, magnificent and and uh, large events that has been undergoing, specifically the FIFA 2020 in Qatar and the uh, Asia Olympics in 2030, that itself would be a platform to, to, to get data. From Google perspective, we believe that, that uh, this data can only be uh, provided to, uh, to assess on prediction rather than uh, prevention, meaning that we provide data that has uh, all the artificial intelligence, machine learning will drive that, that aspect. Uh, many of the events that has been undergoing uh, will gather data. Uh, what again, uh, Nasser has indicated earlier with the experience that they did with the AFC uh, Champion League, that enabled data to enable to uh, that has provided data to enable uh, the federation to make decision in order to predict things in the, in the right level of engagement. Google, uh, we're taking this again very very seriously because we believe that it's all about data and it's all about about providing the latest on the emerging technology, what we call it, uh, of artificial intelligence. I believe the implication of the upcoming, if I am lim limited to the region specifically, uh, the FIFA 2020, it would have uh, 2022, it would have significant impact on, on, on data whereby people would be would be getting a personalized aspect. And that's where big data comes through. And that's what, again, Google uh, Cloud has been uh, has been providing. For Qatar in specific, we are taking the, the FIFA 2022 very seriously. We had recently announced uh, Qatar to be the first uh, in terms of cloud region in, in, in the region, and that itself a commitment to, to the Qatari market. Recently, we looked at, at in, enriching our ecosystem by establishing center of excellence to provide support to the local and, and expat in order to get this implemented. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. That, that's, that's interesting stuff. So we're on the topic of technology and technology for amplification purposes. Um, now, I know you're all going to have a view on this, and I want, I want to now make this a bit more of a, a jumping in uh, sort of um, format. So I'd love to hear from all of you, you know, how, how have you used technology in your roles and your tournaments in, in the various roles that you're in um, for uh, development, economic empowerment, connecting with fans? We've just had a, a, a pandemic. Technology and, and data have never been more important. So who would like to pick this up? Someone jump in here. Ed, maybe I can jump in quickly and, yeah, and just, thanks, Craig, um, thanks, the, I think the uh, the, the pandemic um, outside of the, the the crisis of the health, it's 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 had us all shift our thinking and and uh, and I think you know I do think the business models that try to return to the way we were pre 2020, 2020, 2020 
are going to be struggling uh, with the way forward because everything's changed. Everything's changed with partnerships. Everything's changed with the content. Everything's changed with fans. And for us, we were able to identify that the fact that we're going to be limited on international travel, we've got to try and bring our products more to the fans, not just the original way that we did it, just simply through global broadcast deals and, and getting every single market across the world. So we introduced the AO Virtual Hub, which was during the period of the event, um, you could go, and again, I see, I see Joey nodding his head, he knows it well uh, with Facebook, but you could go into the event as a fan offsite. So a lot more focus and using technology, a lot more focus was placed on the offsite fan and you could actually purchase a ticket into an area, you could go and you could go and experience uh, behind the scenes, you could watch Roger, you know, well, in this case, Roger Ferrer wasn't with us this year, but Serena Williams walked down the corridors going to get treatment. Uh, you could then hear an, an interview with her coach and as an offsite fan, you, it, it wasn't just a media experience just through your regular broadcast, but it was a, a personalized experience that you go and register for. And I think more of that is gonna, gonna take place as you as we can easily build technologies for the for the on-site fan, it's more difficult for the off-site fan, and that's going to rely on on a much smaller world when it comes to communication. I think the pandemic is giving us that opportunity more than ever before. Absolutely, uh, I can see Abdurrahman's hand is raised. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, I, I think pre-pandemic pre digital transformation has been part of a strategy for many organisations, and I think the the implication of the pandemic itself is changing the way we operate, making things done differently. Now, uh, digital transformation becomes a survivability uh, impact. It's not just a matter. Of, of things good to have. And that's why we see recently throughout the pandemic, many of the organization that has uh, digitally uh, transformed has been continuing to grow. And I, I believe that itself is, is quite important uh, element to address. And I think that's one of the key benefits that we got through or post pandemic. Yeah. Uh, NASA come in here because next year is, um, you know, the World Cup there couldn't be a more cutting edge opportunity to talk about technology with with um, the project that's been so many years in the making. How do you think about technology? Well, innovation is one of our core values of this World Cup. And thanks for reminding me that there's about a year to, to the World Cup. So <laughs> we've just, we just added to the pressure that I feel every <laughs> night. Um, but yes, yeah, so our, our innovation and technology team works closely with FIFA's innovation team as well. And, you know, I'm not going to, uh, Professor, that I understand technology very much. Joey and Abdurrahman can be the ones that really speak to you about AI. What I do know is that we're creating a, a one-stop shop sort of hub uh, uh, as an application. Um, I, for many of you who, who may know this, uh, the fan ID that was implemented in Russia, which was sort of a security device, we're trans, uh, transferring into an electronic device, which can be sort of a um, electronic wallet. It becomes your access, security access to stadiums. It becomes sort of your um, identification, uh, and you you'll have an electronic visa, and so forth. But the other the so we spoke into the likes of Google to talk about how advanced their AI is, and and that will be used hopefully uh, to be able to understand fan behavior and so forth, understand what teams they like to follow. Uh, there will be um, FIFA is discussing on having a sort of electronic marketplace for tickets for fans who give back their tickets. It goes straight into a marketplace that people can find available. Uh, with the touch of a button and i know these are ambitious things uh but uh, the technology that i want to talk about is actually the cooling technology which has been um implemented in qatar from as early as 2008. we've moved into about our second or third generation of cooling technology which is a lot more efficient you see that many of the uh, global sporting events uh take place um like qatar close to the equator where the highest density of the populations are with the passing of time, this technology is going to become cheaper. It's quite expensive right now, but we do believe that for future sporting and events uh, that, or entertainment events, they would be able to implement the cooling technology, which we would also be happy to share with the world to be able to have um, events, whether they're sporting or otherwise, in cool, comfortable conditions. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's fascinating stuff, the uh, the cooling technology, um, and, and subject to much conversation and, and, and debate. Um, Wafang Te, come in here. How, how do you think about tech technology? Yeah, you no, know, I, I think uh, uh, pandemic or not, technology has been fundamental to our growth and development as a property. As I mentioned, we are born, we were born in the internet age. We were born in 2011. You know, Facebook, YouTube, Tencent, all the big digital giants were already in existence and growing robustly. And we just basically, you know, in some ways bet our future on them. 
And I say that that bet has, uh, has paid off. You know, if not for technology, we would not be able to build, you know, our viewership and our fan base so rapidly in a short span of 10 years. Today, we're ranked, you know, top 10 in the world in terms of broadcast and digital reach and top five in most statistical categories, uh, be it, you know, overall uh, 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 video views uh, or fan growth. I think fan growth actually were number one on digital of all uh, global sports properties. Um, and that would not have been possible if not for the advent of big digital platforms. Uh, like Facebook, like YouTube, like Tencent, like IT in China. Um, to draw a simple illustration, you know, when the UFC was founded about three decades ago, they had only TV to work with. And then obviously NBA, you, you sort of roll back even more decades, uh, and, you know, and they were in a black and white world, right? Um, when you're working with TV to build reach, that's deal by deal, country by country. Today, we have one partnership with Joey at Facebook and we reach all of the world ex China we go to China, we do a deal with IT, that's all of China, right? So the advent of digital technology allows us to reach more people a lot quicker. But on top of that, it allows us to engage with them and to your point, monetize as well in many different ways. With Facebook, we have so many different, we have a partnership that encompasses so many different things. We have AR, VR, we have short clips, medium clips, we have fight content, non-fight content, um, and just so many different things we can do for Joey's uh, users for our community on Joey's platform and that you take that multiplied by five or six big platforms that we work with globally and what you have is uh, is really a technology enabled business uh, in the 21st century that that, that you know whose growth and, and business model is uh, is fundamentally tied you know to uh, to the digital age mm -hmm. um tech in what, what do you say well i just wanted to add uh, that you know all the technology that's applied becomes a data touch point and what we're trying to do right now from a Sports Singapore perspective is to see whether we can initiate and encourage uh, what we call a, a data exchange, a sharing of data across different sports segments between private and public sector. And we're working very closely with our Media Development Authority to see how we can orchestrate this and uh, be able to work with our partners as well, Facebook and Google. I think there's a lot of data that's out there that can be useful across different sectors. And I think a private public a partnership with respect to such a data exchange would be very useful. Mm -hmm. A lot, a lot of chat here about um, you know various platforms and, and Facebook in particular. You know is so well known as, as the social go-to and Instagram as well, of course. Um, you know, does sport make up a high high proportion of advertising on these pre platforms, sort of relative to other sectors, um, Joey? And and what's the future of sport on social media? I think one of the questions is: Will we see big matches rather than just highlights finding their way onto these platforms in the way that sort of cable networks have taken sport and and other more traditional uh, ways of streaming? Will will the big giants of social media start to um, take a bit more market share? Do you think? Um, let me speak on behalf of Facebook and Instagram and not on behalf of social media overall. Yeah, fine. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and even before that, let me just go back to the technology bit. Yeah, of I have a couple of comments there. One is, I don't think technology is an option anymore. It's core to business. And technology can, cannot be one-off. And as Wapang mentioned, you know, technology is what they have built their business on. It needs to be everywhere. And if you want to be engaging, attracting and engaging younger generation, you need to be behaving differently than what, you know, than what, let's say, um, federations which started or leagues which started 50 years back did. Uh, I mean, uh, one championship had put their content in virtual reality. So did Tennis Australia. I mean, Tennis Australia, if you think of them, I've, I'm like a big fan of Tennis Australia uh, because they were always so progressive. If you, if, if, if you go to Melbourne during, you feel it's festivity, you feel it's for, they want to bring in people. They are borderline, you know, they are not just for the sport, it's just not for the sports fans. It's entertainment. And I think that's what you need to do, right? You need to attract the, the core fans and you need to be expanding your, your audience base. And I think that's what One Championship and Dennis Australia have been able to do. Uh, and then on sports, is sports a big revenue driver for Facebook? Uh, I can't comment on, on that, but I think the answer is no. Okay, it's, it's not. But as I said, sports is very core cool to what Facebook does. As I said, it builds connections, it builds community, people interact with each other, it drives conversation, it brings in engagement, and that's what excites us, right? And we are not here to challenge the business models of 
P2A networks or ATV networks. You know, they have robust businesses, they have good reach, production capability. What we want to try to do or what we're trying to do is to grow the size of the pie and not take someone else's pie, right? So your live content might be, let's say in the case of one championship, event, it might be on Turner in the US or Tennis Australia on Fox in certain markets, right? We are saying there's an audience for that, but there's also an audience for match highlights or shoulder content or lead-in content, right? There needs to be a platform to, cap, you know, to capture the conversations, right? And we could be that. So we are happy to be providing a very complimentary platform to what broadcasters do. And, uh, and, and, and look here, you know, and, and, and there, there, might be, there might be something that works for mainstream sports, right, which gets distribution on mass media. But once you start looking at the niche sports, you know, often we are the primary platform of distribution, right? So the role that we play there is very different. So again, you know, we have, we have several business opportunities, several business solutions on our platform. It depends on who you are, it depends on your business goals, and we help you, you know, we help guide you towards them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have five minutes left, and I, I feel like we need another five hours here. Um, but we'll try. And, the one thing I wanted to bring up was the power of individuals in sport. Um, when I think of major tournaments, I often think about the individuals. Usain Bolt, Diego Maradona, Muhammad Ali, these guys are the greats. And I feel like the legacy of tournaments, of course, there's a wider impact and there's this economics that ties into them, the socioeconomics and legacy goes through so many different aspects. But when we think about those moments on the pitch, I feel like that is what a lot of people connect with. And I want to ask you guys a little bit about, you know, th this golden era. Let's start with, with Craig, you know, the golden era of Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, you know, has the sport relied on those individuals, do you think? You know, what happens when those guys retire? You know, I'm sure there are other guys coming up, but that really is the golden era of tennis. And I think this can this is a question for everyone in, in, in a certain respect as well, in terms of how much do individuals matter? We saw Cristiano Ronaldo moving the Coca-Cola bottles. Four billion dollars wiped off, off Coke's share. You know, the power of these guys is phenomenal. What what, what do you what Craig kick us off with with the power of individuals in sport and and that, and that legacy sort of thing? Well, I think it's just a reminder for those running and promoting events. You've got to connect to that power every single day and never miss it. Um, but uh, certainly, individuals drive it, uh, and they part of it. I mean, in tennis, we have had the golden era, pick on the men's side with those three. But the great thing about sport, and and, and we we talked at the beginning about the legacy, and just bring it back to that is that it goes on and uh, we get a new era of champions and we get a new opportunity for, and we want to play a part in that. And our objective obviously as leaders in sport is trying to accelerate that process to make sure you never have those gaps. I'm very excited about what's coming forward in tennis particularly. And I'm also particularly excited about seeing what we're going to see in sport over the next year and how we've transformed our businesses and transformed the opportunities for our fans. So mm -hmm. yep, it plays a big role, but we play as big a role yeah. in making sure it plays a big role. And, and, and Maggie, jump in here because um, you know how do you think about about ha sort of harvesting that that next talent? You know, what, what, how does that work? How do you get people into the game? Maybe, and I'm not just talking necessarily about the mainstream sports broadly. How do you get people interested? How do you how do you drive that engagement? I think um, when you talk about the power of individual, it has to come in 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 two ways, and I think that the power of athletes has a further reach than associations and events. So that's something that we need to acknowledge as well. And in today's world, it's not just about the, the big stars. I mean, look what the Danish, the captain of the Danish team did during that game. I mean, he became yeah. a superhero. So the kind of heroes we are seeing is not just uh, on the pitch heroes, but really the reach they have is further than that. So the power of individuals in sports becomes bigger and athletes are major influencers, no matter you know, the, the success on the pitch they are. So I think it's, it's bringing that to a bigger and stronger dialogue with fans as well. And I think that's also something I wanted to say when we were talking before about technology and fans is that the connection between fans and athletes becomes even more powerful and fans are looking more for purpose. And they are looking more for, uh, you know, what is behind the field? What are the stories that connect them with those athletes? What is the culture that is behind that? How do they get there? And so for me, the power of individuals goes beyond the athletes, 
beyond the sports organizations, but also how we connect with the community yeah. and the people around sports. Got it. So that's yeah. what I, I would heroes. say my perspective. Exactly. And I think we're going to wrap on that note, which is a lovely way to end because I cannot wait for all of these sporting events to come back and see them in person. I think we've dealt very well during the pandemic, keeping ourselves alive, you know, and interested in all of these things. And I think this group have, has been fascinating because we all love sport and we all, you know, can't wait to get back to it. So thank you all for joining. And I, I hope to have this conversation with many of you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.